from the White Lotus Gallery, and I am delighted to have Rich Bergaman here with me today um, to guide us through his um, photography exhibition here at the White Lotus Gallery. And um, Rich has been, ex you know, a professional fine art, um, well, fine art photographer for more than 40, 30 years, um, even while he um, had careers in journalism, um, teaching, um, curating, um, but, but yeah, photography has been his companion for, for many years, decades. And um, the first time we showed um, Rich's work was I think back in 2014 when we had a photography show titled The Golden West. And so it's, um, it's wonderful to have Rich, Rich's work back in the gallery again um, in the show titled The Vanishing West. And so without further ado, I will let Rich start um, talking to us about, about his photographs in the show. And here, let me slide. There we go. Hi, Rich. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Um, like Jennifer said, I'm, I must be really old if I've been photographing that long. <laughs> <laughs> um, it has been a three, almost four decades now, and I, one of my favorite subjects over those years is to go east of the mountains and, and photograph remnants of the Great Western Migration in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and no, I wasn't here then, but back then, miners and uh, homesteaders and, and uh, would-be ranchers moved into the eastern part of the state, eastern part of Washington also, in hopes of, of starting new lives uh, or finding, striking it rich and, and finding their uh, future in, in, in gold. Um, and they left, and a lot of them didn't stay very long. Certainly, miners didn't stay very long. So there's a lot of little mining towns that are, especially in the Elkhorn and Blue Mountains, and uh, and th those ranges in northeastern Oregon, uh, which are always fun to go exploring, looking for. And homesteaders uh, ran into a lot of problems sticking it out in the high desert. Mm -hmm. uh, really was a lot drier than was advertised when they <laughs> pursued their homestead claims and a lot of them gave up after a few years and, and left behind their cabins and things like that. And, and over the 1900s, over that many years, most of those remnants have disappeared, but not all of them. And what I find fun is searching for them, finding evocative photographs of those uh, remnants to sort of tell the history of what happened back. Uh, back then in uh, all corners of, of Oregon in particular. Uh, yeah. When I started out, I mean, I, over the years, I, my photographic media has changed. I started out in the 1990s and the early 2000s using big cameras, large format cameras and big negatives and printing them, fighting them and palladium. And um, about 15, 20 years ago, I uh, moved into photographing more digital cameras, um, like all photographers, we, almost all photographers, mm -hmm. we began to switch over to that medium. And in recent years, the last four or five years, I've been photographing a lot of infrared. Um, and I find that every time I've changed my equipment, my tool, uh, way of seeing, I've changed the kind of photograph I'm taking. Mm. Now I'm taking more landscapes. Back in the 90s and 2000s, I would never call myself a landscape photographer. I, I always was focusing on um, evidence of man in the landscape, hmm. like this picture here. Um, for the last 20 years or so, I have, um, I have, instead of just wandering around looking for ghost towns with friends of mine, I've, uh, I've been doing projects uh, that take a year, sometimes two years to do. Uh, on a certain episode or certain episodes of Northwest history. And this is an example of that. I did a project in the, uh, I think it was 2012 or so. Um, I better check my memory. Yeah, 2012, 2011 or 2012, to try to find remnants of the homestead rush, land rush, that occurred in the Fort Rock Valley, uh, which is south of Bend, and it was part of the last big land rush of homesteaders in Central Oregon. Uh, and in the Fort Rock Valley, it attracted 
a few thousand families, maybe a dozen towns, little towns sprang up in an area that now when you drive through it, you wouldn't know that even a couple of people lived there. Um, that after about 20 years, in about 1920, the place was almost deserted, only a few homesteaders went on. Everybody else discovered that it was too dry and uh, to grow anything, and, and uh, the dry land farming techniques that were ballyhooed that drew them there just didn't work in such high altitude dry desert. Uh, the growing season was just too short, hmm. sometimes just a month between the last freeze and the first frost. So they eventually gave up. This was the Bertrand Homestead site. Charlotte and Mr. Bertrand, his name is me right now, built a homestead on this high level um, area south of Fort Rock, the Fort Rock itself. Um, what's left of it now are a couple of fence posts and an outbuilding and, and a water trough uh, carved out of a whole log of, of um, uh, pine. And uh, this is a for me, this kind of emptiness kind of is part of what I wanted to photograph. I wanted to, I wanted to show not just a tumble down shed or whatever this is. I wanted to show its place in the environment and how wide this environment is. Um, I was lucky that year to have really nice skies all, all fall along. I photographed mostly in the fall. Um, over here, over here is a recent photograph that went back about three or four years ago to photograph, to get a better photograph of Fort Rock itself. So that's the monolith that the Fort Rock Valley is named after. Um, it's called Fort Rock, but it was never a fort. Um, all of Central Oregon, certainly Fort Rock Valley area, was underwater in prehistoric times. This was a, a lake, a huge inland lake. Um, and native, the Paiutes, or perhaps their ancestors, lived in the area and hunted mammals in the area, which was, this was pretty lush. Uh, environment then. Mm -hmm. And there's evidence that they lived in some of the shallow caves in the Fort Rock uh, itself and in, a, in a, another um, exposed large rock formation over here. Um, was a, a cave is where the Fort Rock, famous Fort Rock sandals were found by a University of Oregon professor. I think, was, I think it was Dr. Pressman back mm -hmm. in the early part of the 1900s. The oldest evidence of human habitation wow. in the West. So whereas this picture was taken before I was doing it, where this is just this is photo, this is pigment ink print photograph with a digital camera in black and white. Huh. Still, the clouds are great because it's a lovely day. <laughs> um, so the exhibit, this is a great gallery, and I'm really um, honored to be in the gallery. It's a beautiful space, and it um, it's just nice to see my pictures hanging in here. Um, so I'm going to go along, I think, and I'll talk about different pictures. Yeah. Uh, if, if that's okay. That and, sounds great. Uh, and they jump around. Like I said, I, I've been doing historic projects, history-related projects. And this one is from, is actually kind of a tangential picture. It was taken while I was doing a project in uh, uh, the Fort Rock project, which I explained over there. But it's really not part of the project. I was driving from my uh, artist residency, which is at Playa, down at the other end of Summer Lake, I was going driving up to Fort Rock to do some photography and pass these these guys, Dad and his sons, uh, moving their cattle down the edge of Summer Lake. And you'll be forgiven if this doesn't look like a lake to you because it's a dry lake bed, like a lot of things in Eastern Oregon. Mm. It's a playa, and I just couldn't believe it. So I stopped the car and jumped out with my camera and ran, you know, off the road and. Took the photograph. I had two. I could only get two photographs before it got too dusty and and it got kind of mishmashy where the, where the cattle were. It was only after I looked at the negative that I, not the negative but the digital file mm -hmm. that I recognized that there was these, these two uh, wheels here that couldn't have been in a better position if I had put them there myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't even see them when I took the photograph. To tell you the truth. Yeah, that 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 was. I, I enjoyed hearing about. How you took this photograph? Any, any pictures with a person in them? Um, this is just how it worked out. I'm not a people photographer. <laughs> this image is uh, from Baker County. Uh, one spring morning, I was um, out uh, investigating, doing an artist residency in Baker City, and I was staying in a little house and a farm and, or a ranch, and it was snowing in May. So I hopped out with my camera, walked down the road, and saw this picture uh, of a farmer, you know, in an 
emergency setting, <laughs> got to get hay out to the cattle because they can't reach the grass. Wow. So he was moving down and dropping hay out where the cattle were walking along, uh, following him dutifully. <laughs> <laughs> so that was just a lucky instance where, uh, where the atmosphere was nice and the scene was nice. Yeah, and this, is, this was actually a, a photograph that um, Sandy Brown Jensen um, just kind of highlighted this morning on KLCC and just talking about how, you know, the, the, in the foreground, the, the cows and the, and the rancher, it's so sharp and dark. And then, but then in the middle, you have that layer of fog or mist and, and then seeing kind of the dust of, dusting of snow on, on top of the hills. Just, I just heard while uh, driving down here. I heard her program. Yeah. And she said she, she described the cows as being like black silhouettes, and and in fact, I I made sure that you could see snowflakes falling in front of the black. Yeah. <laughs> so they're not perfectly silhouetted. Uh, there's yeah. a little bit of value in there still. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it'll. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't mean much to anybody, but photographers who take pains about the little places <laughs> in their photographs. Um, this image here is uh, one of my more recent pictures. It's an infrared photograph of the Long Barn at the Sod House Ranch, uh, which was the northern headquarters of the Pete French Cattle Empire in Eastern Oregon. There's another Long Barn at the Pea Ranch at the southern end of his big spread. I'm not sure how many thousands of acres it was, um, which is very close to French Glen, and a lot of people have seen that one. This one's not so easy to see because the South House Ranch has a whole bunch of uh, big old 100 year old cottonwood trees out front that uh, herons and uh, not cranes but egrets nest in uh, during the spring and the summer. And they don't let people back there more than three months of the year. The very late summer, like September and October, maybe a little bit of August, can anyone go back there and, and look at this old ranch, which is kept up pretty well by the Mount Hill Refuge people. Mm -hmm. There's about 10 buildings on, on the ranch site that are still from the original, you know, several, a uh, hundred plus year ranch. Wow. Um, uh, and, uh, one project I did was uh, the, um, what would you call the history and legacy of Baker County called East of Eden. Uh, it was an artist residency in Baker City and I, they wanted me to drive all over Baker County, which I didn't realize until then was huge, <laughs> um, and photograph uh, a bit, whatever about its, its history I could find. One of the living bits of its history is the Sumter Valley Railroad, a narrow gauge railway that runs from um, Sumter to uh, McEwen Station, which is where this was taken. Actually, it runs the other way around. You, you board at McEwen Station, take the train into Sumter, which is an old gold, gold mining town, that isn't, it calls itself a ghost town, but literally it's not, people live there. Yeah. Have vacation homes and sometimes winter homes for uh, winter sports, they go and stay there. Mm. So it's a few miles apart, so you can ride this narrow gauge railroad, steam railroad still, it's run by, it's owned and run by a volunteer organization. Um, and it, it's really neat, they have about three engines uh, and, and a vintage uh, railroad car. So I was waiting for a ride in the morning because the sun was just coming up and, and they were pulling in to get put water in the, in the engine. Yeah, I was, I was sharing with, with um, a couple of visitors one time that, that I actually went on the, the, uh, the, the train rides too. Oh, yeah, and, and I think I must have visited at the right time. It was during the summer and um, they actually had volunteers dress up as Bandits, <laughs> and that was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's a nice organ, a nice group of, of mostly guys who uh, keep that running. Yeah. Um, this is an old homestead uh, in Washington State, uh, south of Goldendale, which I don't know much about at all, except that it's just really creepy looking, <laughs> with, its, with its branches and the orchard kind of still closing in on the building. Um, I photographed this in some time ago, 2014, so six, seven years, eight years ago, six, seven years ago. Don't, so I, don't, I haven't been by it for a while. I think it was by about four years ago and it was still there. Um, but who knows, these things don't last forever. 
which is why I have fun looking for them before they disappear. Um, a wigwam burner, another thing that you see disappearing in Oregon. Uh, there aren't too many of them left. Wigwam, if you don't know, wigwam burners were used by mills. Uh, there used to be a mill here. It was, it's been torn down since. This is halfway Oregon. Halfway is, um, is halfway between Cornucopia and, and Pine, I believe. It's far eastern uh, uh, Baker County, just before the Snake River. Uh, that's where halfway is located. And it, it uh, one time back in the beginning of the internet, it took some money from some internet company to change its name temporarily to halfway.com. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and then that period was over with. But <laughs> anyway, halfway is its old name. Um, there, are, there are a few of these still around. There's one um, along the Sayuslaw River um, west of Eugene um, on the way to Deadwood. Yeah. And uh, there's a, there are a few others around, but not too many. There's one in Drain. Um, this is a very good looking one with the cat still on it, you know, the screen. Yeah. These were outlawed about the 1970s because of the pollution from, uh, well, from burning wood waste. That's what they were for. They burnt sawdust and wood waste. Nowadays, they have uses for that that are commercially viable. But back then, they just burned it up. Mm. Until in the 70s, people get back. <laughs> so all the pictures you've seen so far are pigment ink prints, meaning they are photographed with a digital camera and uh, printed uh, on an inkjet archival inkjet pigment print. Now that means it uses pigment ink, which is long lasting. Um, but this picture here and a few coming up, uh, the smaller pictures are platinum palladium prints. Uh, this is a picture of the interior of the Pete French Round Barn in Mellonhill County, photographed uh, some time ago. <laughs> and, uh, Looks like 2007. These platinum palladium is an interesting process I did for many years in the, in the 90s and the early 2000s. It requires a large negative to make a print because it's only sensitive, platinum palladium material is only sensitive to ultraviolet light. Mm -hmm. So you can't enlarge it. Uh, you have to have the negative in contact with the printing surface and therefore the print can only be as big as the negative. So you're limited in size, it used to be limited in size. Um, the process is from the 1800s, late 1800s, one of the earliest and most, and still some, one of the most permanent photographic processes known. And you take uh, a combination of platinum and palladium and iron salts uh, in, in solution and you coat it on a piece of um, watercolor paper, dry it, place the negative on top and expose it either to the sun or to an ultraviolet printer. Mm. Um, and this was taken with an 8x10 camera, which I used to hold around. <laughs> now it's sitting in a closet. Um, <laughs> down, down one shelf below the digital camera I use all the time. It's very jealous, I'm sure. Oh. Uh, nowadays, you can make a... Hi. Hello. Nowadays, you can make a, um, a large negative on your digital printer. You can take a picture with a digital camera like this, and instead of printing out a print, you print out a negative. Mm. And they take that negative and make a platinum palladium print, which is uh, some photographers doing nowadays. It's kind of a hybrid process because they really love the tonal value of platinum palladium and its longevity. It's, it, it's not as um, brilliant and contrasty as other mediums, uh, and certainly not some pigment ink mediums, but it is uh, very rich in the midtones. Yeah. It's kind of. Uh, it's sort of like the cello of photography <laughs> ah. as opposed to the violin. It doesn't, it's not real contrasty, but it really is mellow and uh, invites you to look inside, especially since it's printed on watercolor paper. Mm. Uh, it kind of embedded in the paper instead of being on the surface like a regular silver black and white photograph mm. print would be. Yeah, and we have actually a few. That's right, there's a few more in here yeah. of different things some backyards in French Glen in the afternoon <laughs> with the shadows coming in and um, are you are you usually just at the right place at, at the right time or do you wait for it or let's see I was waiting for dinner uh, <laughs> and I was wandering around waiting for them to start dinner at the French Glen Hotel 
And so then I went back behind the hotel and looked at the house, a couple of houses that were empty that were next door and saw this picture and, and made it. I was for a long time bothered by the really bright light coming through the back window of this shed and the shadow was running across this undulating ground and the picket fence that kind of undulated also. Mm -hmm. That's what I was attracted to. Mm. This is a ranch in Harney County, I believe, um, called the Diamond Ranch. And I just, we, we stopped to answer your question about how do these pictures happen. I, we stopped, me and friends were out looking for photographs. I stopped, we stopped and have lunch. And I'm eating lunch and I'm looking at that picture. And I'm saying, well, look at that. There's windows on the outside, windows on the insides, windows in the middle, all these panes of rectangles. And I thought, well, I just I can't, I have to take a photograph. So I made an eight by 10 negative of it. Yeah. Uh, that's I'm always one of my favorite pictures up on Steve's Mountain of the landscape and nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and this is in Hardman, a ghost town in the upper uh, high desert south of the Columbia River. Yeah. Uh, it's again windows. Windows and doors seem to make their way into my photographs a lot. They used to make it way into them, into the pictures a lot more than they do now. Here's another. Here's three more examples of, of doors. Yeah. And doors. All, all platinum plate imprints. This is Grass Valley, an old church in Grass Valley that um, is probably still there. Maybe it's even refurbished by now. One of the things I discovered about ghost towns over the years is that they, not all of them dwindle away to nothing. A lot of them turn into vacation spots where people come in and buy a property, fix up the homes or build new ones, and, and have uh, summer homes there. Mm -hmm. This is true in, of some of the uh, gold mining towns in the in the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains, mm. for, for sure. There's another door here, platinum palladium print that is of the porch at Shirk Ranch. Yeah. Shirk Ranch is on Guano Lake, um, which is a dry lake bed in uh, central Oregon, just east of the Warner Valley and Antelope uh, Refuge. And it's a about a four or five building complex that the BLM owns and doesn't maintain, but it owns it and it tells people to stop screw, you know, messing around with it, <laughs> ruining it. Um, the Shirk Ranch was established by David Shirk, who originally had his ranch over in the Capitol Valley and was in competition with Peter French. Mm. But he got into some scrapes with him, uh, was acquitted of killing one of Peter French's men, and after that he moved his whole uh, family and, and, and crew up to this spot, godforsaken location um, on Guano Lake, which isn't a lake. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was then, but it ain't now. Yeah. Uh, and built this, built an interesting uh, ranch with a you know, water tower and a fort, a bunkhouse and big houses. It's a big house, two floors. Yeah. And, and a workbench. So do, do, do you usually um, come to sort of know about the places and their history first, or do you visit and take photographs and then find out more about their history? Well, that works both ways. It yeah. used to be that I would find these locations and learn more about it. Um, but then when I started doing the project, the history projects, like East of Eden for Baker County history and the Fort Rock mm -hmm. uh, homesteads, um, and a couple others I've done. I researched beforehand and, uh, and then go looking for pictures that I figure are out there. Mm. I try to find things that would fit, you know, that history. Yeah. Uh, granted, this is one of the um, gold mining towns in the uh, Elkhorn Mountains, uh, east of, or I should say west of Baker City that still has, it's a good example of a, of a ghost town that has come back to life. Um, it, that's the old uh, church and I believe also school. Yeah. Uh, doubled as both, taken from the cemetery, looking uh. towards the back of it. The front of it's looking that way and it's a, it's a little town on a, on a hillside um, that you know, everybody moved out of, but now people are moving in with trailers to live, you know, and, and RVs and that kind of thing, and some buildings being fixed up. Yeah. And it's become kind of a, a lived in again. That, that has not been the fate of Whitney. Whitney is along Highway 26. It's there. It 
it's a, it's a remnant of a town that used to be associated with a big lumber mill that burnt down back in the 30s and 40s. It was at the end of a narrow gauge railway that delivered lumber towards Baker City and, and the gold mines. Uh, uh, it has fewer buildings than this now. That was the last time I saw it, uh, a couple of those buildings in this history have gone, fallen down. Hmm. The this root is, cellar. This is the root cellar of the Stratton homestead in the Fort Rock Valley, um, similar to the Burchard homestead. In fact, it's very nearby where it's on, this is on um, private property. So fortunately, because of that, it hasn't been damaged. And a lot of the, the whole valley, all the cabins, people left in a hurry. And so people write about in the finding in the 20s and 30s, finding clothes still hanging in closets, coffee cups still sitting on tables with dust all around them. And um, all that started getting dismantled by, you know, poke people poking around or, or ranchers in the area needing the lumber and taking the lumber from the old houses and knocking them down because they were in the, uh, dangerous for their cattle if their cattle happened to be using that area for range. Mm -hmm. So only a few things remain and ones that do are usually on private property. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of hard to find. You have to ask around and, and that kind of thing. Um, and this is one of the first ones I found, thanks to somebody um, uh, contacting me when he heard about my project and took me up to it. Wow. It kind of keeps people away from it. Yeah. So I don't know what else you want to talk about. <laughs> uh, there's a few more pictures, but. This is a good example of an infrared photograph. These are the uh, century cottonwoods outside of, uh, or on the front part of the Sod House Ranch on the Malheur Refuge that I mentioned is where the large wading birds uh, are fond of nesting. And so that's what closes the ranch up every, every spring and summer. Yeah. And this is a horse that just this Appaloosa just loved to pose. <laughs> He's in a junkyard of agricultural equipment called uh, Power of the Past because it's all equipment that was uh, almost all equipment that was not gasoline generated yeah. or operated run by horses. And he has a run of the place sort of like a, a dog in a junkyard <laughs> and uh, we're very always interested in getting an apple from somebody. <laughs> this is in Baker County and I was photographed when I was doing the, the history of Baker County project. Ah. And it is a pigment imprint, but not infrared. Uh, these are Oregon trail ruts outside of, on the hillside called uh, Flagstaff Hill, outside of Baker City. Uh, there's a, a few remnants through the sagebrush still of the ruts. They got compacted so much that sagebrush doesn't grow in them. Wow. And so, fortunately, it rained before I took this picture, and so it made the, the trail more visible, you know, reflecting light. Yeah. It's a regular pigment ink print from a regular digital camera. Had I shot it with a, uh, which I wasn't using at the time, an infrared camera at the time, the trail would be really dark. The water uh. would be black, the trail would be dark, and the sagebrush would be much whiter than it is now. Hmm. That's what, and the, and the sky would be darker. That's what, that's what I like about um, infrared, the dark skies, the dark water. Yeah. And uh, to a certain degree, the lighter vegetation, especially in Eastern Oregon, where there isn't a lot of blatant greenery like lawns and stuff like that. We that, just. That gets too light. Yeah. Uh, we just got a, actually a question from Carmen La Luna. I don't know if you know Carmen. Um, she asks, what are you working on now? And do you have a new series in the works? And she said, these are beautiful. Um, well, I don't know. You're supposed to be afraid to talk about your current projects for fear <laughs> they don't come out and people think, well, whatever happened? Uh, what I'm working on now is a um, landscapes in the Lam Valley landscapes of the Kalapuya tribes, uh -huh. trying to find um, landscapes, especially ones that would have uh, uh, natural features or plants uh, that Kalapuya used. And they're like, oh, dozen maybe Kalapuya tribes that lived in the Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. um, the Santa Anne and the, the Kalapuya south of there and, and uh, Mary's River and the Muddy Creek and Tom, 
quite a few living in kind of smallish areas, all in river drainages. And so that's my project now, is to try to find photographs, landscapes um, of the California, which um, I just started this year. So wow. Who knows if it'll ever be completed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate Carmen's question anyway, because, yeah, yeah, otherwise. So, well, that's pretty much it. A couple of pictures of, yeah. a picture of a homestead in, uh, in the Fort Rock Valley, the Golden Homestead, which the descendants of the Golden still own, and, and try to keep it up. They don't live there, they live in Bend, but, and they're getting on in years. But this is a barnyard. The interior of this barn is another great photograph. Um, last time I was there, though, it had a lot fewer shingles than it had back there in 2012. And this is Shanico, kind of a funny picture. The mailbox is Shanico <laughs> Historical Society. Um, and it's somebody's house, I guess, that maybe is the president of the Shanico Historical Society. <laughs> <laughs> Shanico is another one of a couple, three towns in Eastern Oregon that bills itself as a ghost town. like. So, like, um, uh, what's the other ones I'm talking about? But, but they're not really ghost towns. Like, but, like, um, with... Okay. Oh, right, right. But they're tourist towns. Yeah. Kind of. People still live there, because they like people to visit, based on the fact that they are old towns that are hanging on. Yeah. Most people think the ghost town is empty. Uh, some people call towns like that gray towns instead of ghost towns. Ah. Meaning they're almost ghost towns, but they're not. Yeah. Okay, well. Sumter, that's the sound I was trying to think of. Right, Sumter. Yeah. Um. Well, uh, thanks for the little, going along on a little tour with me. <laughs> um, and looking at these things. Yeah. So come on in and get a good look when you have a chance. Yeah, um, the exhibition is here through June 12th. So we're, we're just at the beginning of this, this show, and, and so there's plenty of time to um, come into the gallery and, and look at these marvelous photographs by Rich Brigman. And again, thank you so much, Rich, for being here with us today. And, um, and oh, we, I also want to say we've scheduled um, May 15th, the Saturday, so a week from this, this coming Saturday, so May 15th, you will be here at the gallery from at least 11 to three o'clock. And so if, you, if people are in town, in the area, have planned to visit, um, that would be a wonderful day to come meet you and chat with you about, about the show. Great, yeah, it would be nice. Yeah, so um, thank you so much for tuning in and we hope you'll, you'll visit the gallery soon or, or you know, Definitely catch um, Rich's show, and, and you can also see images of the photographs on our website at www.wlotus.com, and just click on current exhibition on the left, and then you'll see all of the photographs that are in the show. But I do wanna say it's definitely so much better to see them in person, because for example, like Rich was talking about, you know, the snowflakes in front of the, the cows, you, you, you can't, really see it um online so please if you can come in and visit the show and thank you again for tuning in and we'll see you next time